Hello and welcome again to the Writer Review. This is Eric Karad Writer, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2013 period piece drama film titled Bell. Now, Bell was, of course, inspired by a painting that was once um, that was once hung at the Kenwood House in England. But now it has since then moved to the Scone Palace in Scotland. And I'm going to go into a little more details about this. Anyhow, this is a period drama film. It runs for one hour and 44 minutes long. It is directed by Emma Asante. It is produced by Damien Jones. The script was done by Misan Sege. The score was done by... Rachel Portman, the cinematography by Ben Smithered, and it was edited by Pia Di Ciola and Victoria Boydell. And the stars of the movie are Gugu Mabatha Ra, uh, Tom Wilkinson, Sam Reed, Emily Watson, Sarah Gadden, Miranda Richardson. Penelope Wilton, Draco Malfoy, I mean Tom Felton, James Norton, Matthew Good, Alex Jennings, and James Northcott. Okay. It's been said that Jane Austen's Mansfield Park was a brilliant fairy tale though not to take this claim in a disparaging way. Being that the romantic subplots would have been deemed impossible had it not been for their limitless, limitless supply of wealth and that their prized investments came from cheap slave labor. Now, this movie is actually inspired by a painting that was uh, done by some artist who... Actually, it was originally thought it was done by uh, someone by the name of Johan Zafani, but then it was later credited as somebody by the name of another artist who goes by the name of David Martin created this uh, painting that had a black Muslim woman by the name of Dido Elizabeth Bell. She is like pictured next to. Lady Elizabeth Murray, and many people have often wondered who was this mysterious uh, girl of mixed race pictured next to Lady Elizabeth Murray. In fact, this movie is kind of, I guess you could say, a bit of a an, an historical account though it's sometimes often questioned if whether or not this was a work of fiction or a work of nonfiction. I mean, I'm sure there was, of course, there was going to be, of course, like in every period piece film, there's going to be a lot of exaggeration. There's going to be a lot of drama and a lot of, and a lot of uh, civil liberties. But then again, this is kind of like what you would probably expect to see in a period piece film. And I don't know, I mean, as much as I hate to sound snotty, but I guess unless you were living at the moment, we can't really quite make any claims as to whether the events that was depicted in this movie were real or if it was just some imagination or a little bit of both. Of course, the movie also uh, depicts a very important time of in British history. If anybody is familiar with the Zong Massacre, which actually kind of like put an end to, to the slave trade that was affecting, you know, Boston, which was, of course, affecting uh, Great Britain as they were doing, you know, like, business trades with them in South Africa with the, uh, you know, like, like slave trade. It was like a business. Yeah, I know it's a little bit hard for me to say because of the fact that thinking about this thing makes me kind of sick to my stomach. 
But unfortunately, this was a thing that really did happen. And as much as we can't, we're not, as much as we can't accept it, and you don't have to, I don't like this whole idea, I didn't like this whole idea either. But unfortunately, just like all important moments in history, it happened. And, you know, like they say, we can't change the past. Because whatever happened in the past stays in the past. But it happened. And we just have to accept it. We don't have to like it. But it did happen. But this was a movie that kind of like ended the whole Zong trade agreements that was happening at the time. And we ha and Dido Elizabeth Bell was the main catalyst to put an end to it. Of course, it took a lot of persuasion. It took a lot of guts. It took a lot of bravery. But she stood proud and she stood tall and she and she told her great uncle that this is not the way to do business and that this act of trading a human for another human is wrong, it's uncalled for, it's and it's morally reprehensible, and it should be abolished. Now, I know that sounds easier said than done, and it is. But, you know, after going through long periods of looking into it, eventually the slave trade in England did come to an end. Now, whether this was actually done through complete accuracy or hyperbole, just leave it up to the viewers. Personally, I think there was some hyperbole uh, placed in there. But then again, like I said, this is a movie. It's not a documentary. So this is a fictional account of an event that really did happen. And there really were, the, the and the characters depicted here were real characters. But were they put in real situations? Hard to say. It seems that in Jane Austen's world, the economic stability that embodies the characters depicted in her books seem to be dependent on dirty money, hence the origin of the sum filthy rich. Although it's questionable if Jane Austen herself ever intended it that way. Yes, a lot of movies, a lot of books at the time was written centered around people earning a lot of money by doing some of the most underhanded, corrupt, sick, twisted ways. And how the rich tend to get richer and the poor become more destitute. That's kind of like the world that Jane Austen lived in. Obviously, she was anti-capitalist. And, and I think that through capitalism, you know, people just become organically selfish. And she wanted to point it out that way. I don't know if she actually ever intended it that way. Maybe it's just through observation and impression. It's still pretty unnerving when you think about it. And maybe that's why rich people get a bad rap. Not necessarily for the money they make, but how they make it. And it's a shame that romantic tales are catering to the rich and the wealthy. Sometimes I would like to see a story about somebody who's poor. And how they manage to live that way. But when it comes to period pieces, it's all about the costumes. It's all about the settings. It's all about the elaborate elegance within the confines of a palace wall and all the hierarchy in their immaculate apparels 
seem to be the ones that hog up most of the screen time, while all the poor, unfortunate peasants are seen wallowing in their own filth, looking more in squalor than pigs in a sty. Though inspired by the works of Jane Austen, the 2013 movie Bell was based off of actual events following a similar path that Austen takes in her stories, not fully in line with period drama, but focusing on an emancipated half-black woman, woman living the societal structures in 18th century Britain. And that's what we get from Dido Elizabeth Bell. She was born in aristocracy to somebody by the name of uh, Captain John Lindsay. Uh, the story goes, uh, she was able to live behind the walls of an aristocratic lifestyle because, you know, after his death, uh, the wealth and the fame was passed over to her. So, you know, at a, so, you know, she got his inheritance. But did it all even guarantee her complete freedom? Well, it made her a free woman. She's not necessarily under supervision or in shackles or forced to do labor laborious, laborious work that would require heavy hours of overwork and underpaid and underappreciation. No, she's allowed to wear the fancy elaborate clothes, eat the finest meals, live almost like a princess. Yeah, there are of course restrictions to her lifestyle as you know, because of the fact that 18th century Britain was at the most xenophobic and racist and destined to keep their whiteism. They had her, you know, they made her eat in a room segregated from the other guests. When it came to banquets, she had to be placed in a separate table or so. And, you know, many people were not really well accepting her being of an equal status in the hierarchy of British aristocracy. Big surprise? I think not. It's all just because of the color of her skin. My, how Britain has changed drastically in the last 200, 300 years. Some might say it's for the better. Some might say it's for the worse, depending on a person's opinion. Whatever it is, it's all cool with me. I'm non judgmental. Directed by Ama Asante and a script written by Misan Sege, Bell centers around the illegitimate mixed race child of an African slave by Maria Bell and a Royal Navy captain named John Lindsay, played by Matthew Good, who was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, brought up within the realms and the confines of British, of higher hierarchy, British aristocracy, a rather scorned upon by his highly esteemed extended family, who takes guardianship in raising her after he could no longer continue due to his declining health. Though she was called Belle by her father, her aunts and uncles arrogantly refer to her in a more peasant-themed name, simply known as Dido. She blossoms into an elegant woman played by heart by just flawless in her performance. Such an underrated performance. It's a shame that the Academy Awards did not 
consider her in Oscar contention. And though she is strong-willed, who obviously gets discarded due to her race, even though the suitors who want to propose to her are interested in her. And they're not interested in her because of the color of her skin. They couldn't care less about that. What's all important is that she's reeling in the dough. She's got a, an inheritance that's worth a lot of money. And of course, you know, the whole opportunity knocks. And, you know, two of the most well-known suitors is uh, a sensitive guy by the name of Oliver Ashford. And then there's another one who's kind of borderline bigoted and maybe even somewhat, somewhat a psychotic, slimy type by the name of James. They, of course, are interested in her not because of the color of her skin or, or her looks, even though, say, she's pretty. She's very gorgeous, as a matter of fact. But they don't care about that. All they care about is the fact that she's, that she's got money and you know, the Ashford's greedy mother would like nothing more than to marry her, marry one of her two sons in, but for cash purposes. It appears as though as a thing, you know, this is an opportunity. She's like a gold mine. But due to her rich inheritance, She's just another Austin heroine, and the guys proposing her are marrying her because of her powerful background, contrary to her struggling step-cousin by the name of Elizabeth, played by Sarah Goodon, who was disinherited by her father, played by Tom Wilkinson, which is original that in this movie we have the poor white girl, contrary to to the rich black girl. You don't really see that very often. Now, even though in spite of the fact that one is financially sufficient while the other one isn't, Belle and, and Elizabeth are just, are almost practically like sisters. They share conversations with each other. They love to run around in the fields and, you know, just doing typical, typical teenage stuff, frolicking around, enjoying the essence of life, enjoying the benefits of being young, you know, chatting and yakking it up and talking about boys and trendy stuff. You know, like every teenager does. They want to live the life, live their life to the fullest. Because let's face it, the adolescent life is the key to freedom. And then everything just drops off once you hit 20. True. Okay, I know there's going to be some historical inaccuracies in this movie. And I'm going to try and, and, and pan them out. But I just thought it was kind of an original take that you could actually see this movie seem, being seen to have a rich black girl contrary to a poor white girl. One of them is, of course, getting all the glory because she's rich, and the other one is not getting the glory because she's poor. But in the process, uh, we have Tom Wilkinson, his character is the powerful judge Lord Mansfield who is involved in an investment which focuses on slave ship trades while putting his thoughts in questions if it's morally right for humans to be treated like cargo. Dido knows about this case in small fragments but gets better informed from a sensitive vicar's son 
named John DeVigne, played by Sam Reed, who was an apprentice lawyer to Mansfield, until they have an unsettling altercation about the case. You see, this is the first sign of an historical inaccuracy in this one. For starters, John DeVigne, from what I've read, was not an apprentice lawyer for John Mansfield. No, he was actually a French manservant, a commoner but would later become, you know, a catalyst behind the whole Zong massacre, which, of course, put an end to, to slavery in Britain. Dido's self-awareness grows, as does her love for John. And, uh, you know, the reason why... What she sees in John de Vigne is the fact that he's not out for her looks or her money, but more or less he is mostly uh, attracted to her intelligence, her resourcefulness, and her bravery to step up against social injustice. Dido's self-awareness grows as does her love for John. But her aunt, the Countess of Mansfield, played by Emily Watson, and Lady Mary Murray, played by Penelope Wilton, are trying to steer Dido away from John and instead luring her towards a relationship with the, either the or Ashfield, played by Jamie Norton, whose mother, Lady Ashford, played by Miranda Richardson, wants him to marry Dido for her wealth. While his older brother James, played by Tom Felton, who still just can't break away from the Draco Malfoy personification that seems to be his only type of acting skills. I mean, the guy still thinks he's Draco Malfoy. He is also in it for her heritage but even goes as far as to abruptly assault Dido and proposes to Elizabeth. But then, because Elizabeth really has nothing or very little to offer in terms of finance, he just dumps her like a hot potato. So, there you go. If there's... If, there you go, you see. This is just an example of just how corrupt and just how how many just how snobbery could you may think that snobbery will get you far when really it doesn't. And I think there was some more lessons that come from the Ashford siblings, Oliver and James. Though the uh, script and the performances were all very good, as well as even the costumes, uh, the settings, and everything else seems to be really, really well documented, the red herring comes from what's kind of a subgenre it wants to be. It, it can't decide if it wants to be an Austin-inspired period piece or a social commentary drama. And the worst part about it all is that you can't have it both ways. And this holds in familiar territory with other conventional directors. In the opening scene, the drama kicks in with a familiar territory where People are there, but their faces are cut from the camera. Sure, it may look dramatic at first, but it lacks originality. In the end, Bell has some great points of interest, but the execution deprives the movie from being both engaging and wrenching. Now, also, I want to talk about, you know, there are some historical inaccuracies. The first one, of course, as I mentioned before, that John de Vigne was not a apprentice lawyer but a manservant in France 
Also, another thing is is that they also took the liberties to acknowledge that that Dido's mother was dead, but during the time of the movie. Uh, it's been revealed that her mother was actually still living. So, you know, there's a histor another historical inaccuracy thing. Also, the painting that was uh, portrayed in the, fo in the portrait kind of gives us the impression that that Dido and Elizabeth were you know, close at hand as adolescents, and that most of the events that took place in this movie was at a time when Dido was an adolescent, and the events that led up to her marriage to John de Vignier was where the movie kind of has another historical inaccuracy because uh, Lady Elizabeth. Well, Elizabeth, she um, she was actually long married. She married young. She was already long married. And Dido actually did not marry John de Vignier until she was a little bit more later in life. Yes, I know that, he, that whether you were a commoner or a high mucky muck aristocrat, Many people get married. It was actually a normal thing that many people, many women got married at very, very young ages. You know, she was, I mean, you know, Lady Elizabeth, she was about years old. That was kind of the norm back then. But Dido Elizabeth Bell, she didn't get married to de Vignier until she was 32. And they remained married for for 11 years. Uh, they eventually had three children, all of them boys, uh, twin sons named Charles and John. And then a third son named William Thomas in 1802. Uh, sadly, Dido Elizabeth Bell died relatively young. I believe her death was through complications with leukemia. She was very, very young. She was only 43 years old. So, yeah, there there is going to be some historical inaccuracies, and this should not come as a surprise to people. So, if you feel like there is that they butchered important parts in history, I don't think anybody should have grounds to be offended. You just have to consider this is a movie. This is not a documentary. And just kind of like take that into consideration, into deep thought. So when all said and done, I guess you could say the performances were great. The costumes, the settings, the set pieces were all very exquisite and was very well crafted. The direction was great. The script could have used some improvement as to where it wanted to go. And then there was also some parts in this movie that could have been more fleshed out better. Like the Zong Massacre could have been a little bit more further elaborated. But overall, it wasn't a bad watch. It's not the greatest movie I've ever seen. And even though there might have been some Oscar potential for Google Mabatha Ra. Still she still I would give her an acceptance because of how she she handled the story very, very nicely. And uh, yeah.
It wasn't really that bad a movie. I just wanted to see some improvements. So if I was to give this a scale out of 10, I would give Bell a 6.5. I know that seems a bit low, but there were because but because of the though not so well fleshed out script and the historical inaccuracies can be a little bit frustrating. But other than that, it's not really that bad of a movie. So I guess this ends my writer review. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I'll be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Rutt Writer saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.